Well, good afternoon to everybody here in Mountain View. Thanks for coming out. Uh, to our Googlers tuning in at offices around the world, good day to you as well. Um, so we're in for a treat today. Uh, the gentleman to my right probably need no introduction, but I'll still venture to, to try to give him one anyway. Uh, gentleman to my immediate right is none other than director Kyle Patrick Alvarez. Uh, he's an LA based, he's a feature director, writer, producer, and editor. The Stanford Prison Experiment, which we're here to talk about today, marks his third film as a director. In 2010, he won the Someone to Watch Award at the Independent Spirit Awards for his directorial debut, Easier with Practice. The Stanford Prison Experiment was at this year's Sundance Film Festival and the Nantucket Film Festival, and I think it won two awards at Sundance. Uh -huh. Yep. Okay, very cool. Exciting stuff. And gentlemen, to my further right is Philip G. Zimbardo, PhD, AKA Dr. Z, Dr. Zimbardo. Um, he's one of the most distinguished living psychologists, having served as president of the American Psychological Association, designed and narrated the award-winning 26-part PBS series, Discovering Psychology, which hooked me into psychology as a high school student, uh, and has published more than 50 books and 400 professional and popular articles and chapters, among them Shyness, the Lucifer Effect, Lucifer Effect, the Time Cure, and the Time Paradox. He's a bit of a, a Google, talks a Google veteran, so we're excited to have him back here. He's a professor emeritus at Stanford University. Um, he spent 50 years teaching and studying psychology, received his PhD in psych from Yale University, and his areas of focus include time perspective, shyness, terrorism, madness, and evil. I'm really glad you introduced me first. <laughs> <laughs> They gave me a lot more to say here. Uh, we'll close it up, we'll wrap it up. Best known for his controversial Stanford prison experiment that highlighted the ease with which ordinary intelligent college students could cross the line between good and evil when caught up in the matrix of situational and systemic forces. We'll talk a little bit of heroism letter, which is what he's got in his shirt, but uh, let's get started. Just so you guys know, I'll do some Q&A we've prepared for the first half of the hour. And then we've got a mic for, uh, for the audience to do Q&A as well. So for the first part, I want to talk to you, Dr. Zimbardo, and kind of set the stage for us. Okay, so your study, SPE, Stanford Prison Experiment, 1971, this is 10 years after Milgram's study uh, began in 1961. Um, what's going on at this time? Why are studies like this so popular back then? Well, I should first uh, mention an interesting coincidence. Little Stanley Milgram and little Phil Zimbardo sat side by side in James Monroe High School in the Bronx in 1949-1950. And he, as kids, we were talking about situations that, you know, ki you know, kids, I grew up in the South Bronx, he grew up in the North Bronx, you know, you know what, in what way does where you grow up make a difference? And we concluded it makes a big difference. Um, now his study in 1963 at Yale um, uh, used, um, Adults, 20 to 50 year old men mostly, uh, and no co he said no college students, no high school students. And there was no selection factor, just anybody who, who answered living in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, and they got four bucks an hour uh, uh, for a study on memory. So, so that was a lie. So the idea was um, that you would recruit uh, young men, uh, young and middle aged men, uh, in what they thought was a study to help people improve their memory. And the, way, the way they were going to help is by hurting. So there was a, uh, another, another participant who they didn't realize was a confederate. So, one, so the real subject is the teacher, the confederate is the student, the pupil. Um, and the teacher gives them to learn, when they get it right, you say good, when they get it wrong, you deliver punishment. And the way you deliver punishment is by pressing a button on a shock box. The shock box has 30 switches, each starts with 15 volts, and each switch increases by 15 volts. The problem is that the Confederate starts to make mistakes, starts to dumb down, gets shocked more and more. And there's a point at which the Confederate begins to scream and yell, I got a heart condition, and everybody says, I, I don't want to turn the experiment, I don't want to go on. The experiment's in a white lab coat, so that's the, obe that's the authority obedient. The experiment simply says, I'm sorry, you must continue, teacher. The, the experiment requires you continue. So, in order to get out, you had to say three times, I quit, I quit, I quit. Once or twice is not enough. And when it gets to 300 volts, the guy is screaming and out of control, and everybody says, I don't want to go on. So everybody verbally uh, complains. Everybody verbally uh, denies wanting to go on. The problem is, what do they do? 
two out of every three of the thousand subjects goes all the way to 450 volts. At that point, the guy is unconscious or could be dead. So it really shocked, shocked uh, the nation, shocked the world. And the reason I did my study, and then I'll get back to answering what was happening in that t time period, is it's rare that somebody says, do bad shit. Okay? You're in a group, and everybody's doing bad shit. Uh, you're in a corporation, and people begin to cheat and lie and steal and, and get crap. Or you play a role. You're a manager. <laughs> uh, your, your role is you're the bully. Uh, uh, you're the traditional husband. So, so what we want to see, what happens when you're in a situation where situational forces push you in a negative direction, and nobody says you should do good or do bad? Uh, there was something about the 60s and 70s, which for me, I, I miss. Because it was a time of revolution. It was a time of questioning. People were, so it's, uh, civil rights are happening. Anti-war uh, anti activities are happening. Um, uh, really, the start of feminism. So it was really a time, a very, for me, a very exciting, exciting period of, of social change. And, I, and so I think Milgram tied into that. Now, I must say, he was a little Jewish kid, meaning in 1948, he was concerned, could the Holocaust happen again here? Could he and his family end up in a concentration camp? We said, Stanley, don't be stupid. You know, that's Nazi Germany. You know, we're Americans. We're not that kind of people. And he, I still remember him saying, I'll bet they said the same thing before the, the Nazis recruited them to be in the SS. It could happen here. So. I see that. Thank yeah. you for the context. Yeah. So in, in the film and also in interviews, uh, you've said that you had no idea what to expect from your study. So based on, based on Milgram, did you not have a, an inkling that, that what happened might have happened or that folks would respond to the authority in the way that they did? Well, in Milgram's thing, it's really a one-on-one -on -one confrontation. Somebody says, do bad shit, you do it or you don't. Mm. In our thing, we're not telling them to do anything bad. We say, be a guard. Well, in your mind, you know, you've seen movies, you've seen Cool Hand Luke, you've seen Heat of the Night, you've seen other movies, um, that guards have power, okay? Um, so essentially, we assume that there would be verbal abuse. And the question is, how long would it take? Again, nobody wanted to be a guard, as you'll see in the film, because <laughs> guards were like a, a, a policemen who, in the 70s, were called on college campuses to break up anti-war r rallies. So cops, uh, police, policemen cops were pigs, oink oink, in those days. Um, and so essentially, it's that in our study, um, it was difficult for the kids to get in the role of guards. They put on military uniforms, which felt awkward at first. And you'll see the opening scenes, people, the audience laughs at the opening scene. You know, they didn't want to, no, they didn't want to be in that role. And it took one day before mm -hmm. everything changed, as you, as you saw in the movie, and Kyle will talk about that transformation on day two. I see, okay. And not to give too much away from the film, a lot of us were there last night. We had a screening just, just down the street. But um, two quick questions there. One, in the film, as you're sitting in, in one of the hallways, I guess one of your colleagues come and he kind of confronts you yeah. and he says, what's your independent variable in this study? Would you answer that for us now? Yeah, so, so <clears throat> in every experiment, there's something you very manipulate, and there's something you measure. When you do a correlational study, you measure two things. Uh, so I, I want to know, um, are extroverts um, um, uh, more open to new experience than introverts? So I give scale of extroversion, openness to experience, and I do a correlation to say, do they go together? In, in experiments, the, the thing you want to see is, does behavior change? And that's called the dependent variable. It's dependent on what you manipulate. And what you manipulate is called the independent variable, just the terms. So in this case, the manipulation was random assignment of a group of 24 students, have to be guards and have to be prisoners. In the movie, they do the thing of flipping a coin. But in fact, there's a table of random numbers that you give everybody a number, and then you pick out the number, and prisoner, prisoner, and guard. So the reason you do that is at the beginning of the study, there should be no systematic difference on any dimension between prisoners and guards, in height, and weight, and uh, emotional background, et cetera. Wonderful, thank you. And then the last thing here, just to set the context, what are the results of the study? What, if people don't know, you know what did you learn? What did you take away? Yeah, uh, what's interesting about the study, it's been called infamous, controversial, et cetera, et cetera. That's after the fact. There was, in 1971, Stanford University had the, one of the very first human subjects research committees that I submitted the study to. And every student filled out an informed consent to say, I will be in an experiment in which 
you know, uh, there'll be high stress, for, for, uh, there'll be minimally adequate diet, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I can leave the experiment if I, when I, uh, I, can, I can terminate my, my uh, performance or participation uh, simply by saying I, I quit the experiment or uh, something like that. For me, that's a magical phrase. I had to use those words, I quit the experiment. If you say I want out, that wasn't good. Uh, and so they filled out that form. The problem was, before you knew the results, it was kids playing cops and robbers in the basement of Stanford University. What could happen? Nothing. If anything, what they said was, you've been subject the committee, you needed to have a fire extinguisher because there was only one entrance, there's no windows. So if there was a fire, and you'll see in the movie that's happened this thing, they used the fire extinguisher against the prisoners. Um, you know, so in hindsight, you say, wow, it's really unethical. People suffered. How could anybody allow this? They couldn't imagine, as I couldn't, the, what happened in, in two days. Um, and as I, 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 it's not clear in the movie, but on day, at the end of day one, I told my graduate students and my team, we're gonna, if nothing changed, we're going to end this. And nothing's happening. I mean, it's, it's so awkward. It's embarrassing to sit there. And then day two, the prisoners revolt, and suddenly everything changes. Wonderful, thank yeah. you. This is for, for both of you, either of you. Um, so how did you get involved in the project? Why, why this film? Why this time? Talk to us about how that happened. Well, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, the, for me, and then we can, I'll backtrack a little bit to then w with Dr. Zimbabwe's initial involvement. Uh, the script, there, there had been, there's been, or you can chime in at any point. I guess the project has been, pretty much since the experiment happened, someone has been trying to do a film out of it. And, you know, there's been various iterations. There was the writer of In the Heat of the Night, Met you know, brought you down to Los Angeles. This is back in the '70s, you know. Then in the, there was another version at some point. Then there was a version in the '90s that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was going to do before Titanic happened. Um, it was going to be him and Benicio del Toro. Right. Um, and then there, were, and then, and then it led to this version happening. And there was this <laughs> producer who's who's from 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 the Bay Area named Brent Emery, and he reached out to you, and he um, took an you know, option. Yeah, took an option on the on the rights to the story, and. Piece together, they got they they got Chris McCory involved, who has a movie coming out in two weeks about the, the new Mission Impossible movie, and and he brought in uh, a, a guy he writes with sometimes named Tim Talbot. So Tim started writing the script at the same time then that Phil was writing the Lucifer Effect, and so they mm -hmm. were always in touch with each other, sharing the research, sharing the documents, everything. Right. It was sort of like a perfect little storm for Tim to write the script. And the first thing he did was like throw everything in there. You know, just like, okay, let's just start. I've read it. I mean, it's like a 300 something page, whatever, 280 page script. And it, yeah, it starts with waking up on the morning of the experiment, ending, and it put in every detail. And then a lot, really, I think the writing of it for Tim and what Tim did so well was okay, what do you, what do you pull out? And in an effort, then, who are the people we follow in the experiment to, to you know, where is the structure? And it really became, a, a, I think, a, um, an act of, of, of structuring a story around a lot of characters. And, and then the project got cast up. I had a, a, what was a not a star, you know, kind of probably the equivalent of the cast we have now. It was like Ryan Phillippe and Jesse Eisenberg and um, Giovanni Ribisi and Channing Tatum and, you know, at... The times. This was just before they became famous. I mean, yeah. I, I went down and met with all these guys, and they all have become famous young actors. Well, yeah, and it was you know thir thirteen <laughs> years ago. Yeah, and uh, but they could, he couldn't raise the money. Yeah, it was it was they were it just, they were trying to make it a much bigger uh, bigger budget film. It was a different time. Independent film was in a very different time. I mean, this mm -hmm. was I, w I was just going into college at the time, and um, remember reading about the project, and it didn't come together as hundreds. I mean, in the time I've been talking. You know, five movies have died in Hollywood. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, you know, they have the billboards. How many people have died from smoking this year? It's like, <laughs> you can do that same with Hollywood projects. And it didn't happen, but the script was so well, well appreciated that the word of the script kind of always lingered around. Or you read these articles of the great unproduced scripts. Or, and it was always on there. And Brent always held on to the rights, uh, the producer I mentioned earlier. And mm -hmm. this actor from my first film, Brian Garrity, uh, who's one of the stars of The Hurt Locker and, and a bunch of other films, he had auditioned, prob probably had auditioned for the film, you know, 10 years earlier and 13 years earlier, and they were, he was friends with Brent, and they were talking one night, and Brent, uh, long story short, <laughs> long story long, Brent was like, oh yeah, I, I'm still trying to get the Stanford Prison Experiment movie wow. made, and Brian was like, oh, you should send it to my friend Kyle, and sort of the point of that whole story is that it really, like, sometimes these things, or here's this project that people have been laboring over for 40 years, and it just came down to, like, two guys sharing a drink, and then someone being like, oh, I should send that to my friend, and then... I read the script and started to really uh, read about the experiment, learn about it, realize that the script had stayed so true to what the experiment was, 
and from there I got involved with the project. This was a few years ago, I and see. since then it's been. I took a, I took a little time away to make another, to make the film I made before. Uh, and then, but it's really been, it, for Hollywood terms, it went by three years for a film to get made is, is short. I hate to say that, but it is a really short period of time. I see. So uh, this is a question that came up uh, a little while ago in discussion, and the question was, why not a documentary, why a drama, and is it because you inherited the project after it was already written as a drama, or? No, because I, I mean, I get sent, you know, scripts or biopics of people's lives or books and, you know, all the time, and you have to, I, I think when it's something that's contemporary, I there's video of it, and there's interviews of the time, and there's books been written, you know, we're not talking about something that's totally undocumented. You say, okay, well, why, why do this? Why are you gonna yeah. do this as a film? I think a lot of people make movies, and the rationale is, based on true people or biopics or, or situations, and the rationale is, well, there just hasn't been a movie yet, so you gotta do it, and that's not enough for me, and so when I looked at the documentary, the Qu Quiet Rage, the, the documentary that Dr. Zimbardo made about the experiment, and I read the book, I felt that they had done such a good job encompassing the, the studious nature of the experiment. But what mm -hmm. those, those couldn't do, and they wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't be as good a material as they are, is try to create the more experiential or the more emotional, some, something that an actor can bring to the film. And so, you know, you watch the footage, and just like in the film, it's just one camera at the end, and, and it was very expensive to run video in 1971. Oh. So there's, there is quite a lot of footage, but not everything. There's a lot of audio recordings. It just felt like there was this opportunity to literally get inside of that space. I see. And hopefully maybe illuminate some, some uh, the more of that, that, the emotional capacity, the, the emotional effect this experiment had on people. I see. So how did you do the casting? How did you cast? Dr. Z and all that. Uh, I mean, we started with the kids, actually. So it was, you know, it's 25 leads, which is really unusual for a low-budget movie. I mean, it's unusual for any movie, but, you know, and, and, I, and I, saw, I saw them all as leads. I didn't want to say, oh, well, that guy doesn't really do much, so he's not an, you know, we'll just get some, you know, get central casting. I wanted it to be each person, you could train the camera on them, and the scene could become about them. And, um, <laughs> And we, uh, and you know, so we, it took like a long, it was a long time. We, we, we were casting as we were financing. So I basically started just meeting with these guys. You know, I had, a, I had a list of people I knew I wanted to be in the movie. And I started meeting with them, trying to figure out their temperaments. You know, I didn't want to get, young actors can be really, really volatile in a really great way. You know, they can be those guys that just want to dive in and be really methody and want to like only be called, you know, the character's name. And there's so much ambition there. And it's a really great thing. And it's a really great thing if you're making a movie where you can give them all the attention and comforts and things that come along with that. But when you've got, you know, 25 of them around, there's no time for that. So really I was, I was like vetting them. I guess I was doing like psychological yeah, right. vetting on them to see how they would be. So, you know, the one, the hotshot kid who comes in and sits at lunch and goes, yeah, you know, he like unwraps his cigarettes out of it back on his pocket. And he's like, you know, I studied Meisner and I did all this. And this is, a, <laughs> these are the techniques I like to use. He'd say like, that's not the guy that's gonna work. He's incredibly talented, but, and then we started doing auditions and we, we got some of the guys, some of the guys in the bigger parts involved initially, um, and then as we were making the film, trying to cast the, the Zimbardo part, it's really, it's tough. You want someone who can evoke that feeling, but you're not trying to do mimicry, but you want it to also, as much as we were recreating the experiment, try to match that kind of feeling. And I've just always loved Billy Crudup. I, I've always, um, he's always been one of my favorites. I think he's underutilized. I think he's underappreciated. And, um, and he's just incredibly talented. And, and fortunately, I, I just made a movie, I had made a movie with Corey Stoll, um, who is so weird to see him, oh, he's an Ant-Man on the same weekend, like blowing things up in a CG stuff. But he, uh, Corey had just done a movie with Billy and had told Billy that he really liked working with me. So when uh. the script came around to Billy with my name on it, you know, he was interested. But the interesting thing to con connect to what you just said was when I first sat down with Billy, his hesitation was, um, he said, well, I just don't understand how did they not know this was gonna happen? And I was, it was sort of, that was his big thing that was holding him back from maybe saying yes to the project. And I, th I remember it was like, a, it was like an 8 a.m. meeting because he had a plane to catch and I was like tired and I was like, and it like, one of those weird moments where it dings and I was like, well, he didn't know it was gonna happen because the Stanford prison experiment hadn't happened yet. You know, this was the thing that defined it. Hmm. That's where, it's not naivety. There was no, there was no point of reference. And, um, and I think that was the thing that sort of got Billy on board. And if you, if you it's like, if you, he's just one of those guys, if you can work with him, it's, it's like a like highlight, you know? And I was wow. really glad he, he did, I was really glad he did the movie. And I was really glad all these guys, I mean, Ezra, the first, Ezra Miller, the first time I uh, you know, met on the film, I, was, I said, you know, if we don't make this movie with Ezra Miller, we're like making a mistake. He's wa he walked from 1971 into 2015, like it's bizarre. <laughs> he's, he's not of this era and he, um, wow. 
And he, and you know, but the, when we put this cast together, our dream was to build a cast like The Outsiders, you know, one of these from Days and Confused where you look back 10 years and, uh. you know, we would always say that, we look back 10 years and you're not gonna believe all these guys were in the same movie. And really it's been like 10 months, you know, we didn't, we didn't expect that, we didn't know Ezra was gonna be The Flash and now the new lead in the Harry Potter, one of the new leads in the Harry Potter, the spin of Harry Potter spinoff and uh, Ty Sheridan and his Cyclops and Keong Lee has the Maze Runner, like all these guys have, they, they, these are all things that happened after we made the film, and part of that's engineered, part of that's luck, and part of that's, yeah, I don't know, the part of that's mojo or something, you know, and um, and so it was a really, it was a privilege and like an embarrassment of riches to get to work with all of these guys. I see. But you also said uh, you had them read both prison and guard parts. Oh, wow. Yeah, when Everybody. we had when we had people come in and audition, when we did the more not open casting calls, but you know, would bring actors in. For the most part, unless I had something specific in mind, but most of the times we just said, they'd be sent, we wrote scenes. So I would combine some of the characters and just put some of the highlights of moments that I needed to see. And we just said to them, you can come and read one, you can read the other, you can read both. And um, it was an interesting thing. And in some cases, I would cast them against the part they thought they should play. Hmm. Some cases, they just did what they did. They knew themselves, you know, so it was a weird thing. And in a lot of cases, it was really fun to try to take some of these kids who, a lot of them were from Disney shows and Nickelodeon shows, and this is sort of their first more serious feature, and be like, oh no, you're gonna be a guard. You know, you're like, well, I was a Hannah Montana's best friend, you know, and it's like, <laughs> and, you know, but that's, but then that's fun for them because then they don't, you know, are like, you know, I remember like J Jim, uh, James Wolk uh, was just so, who plays one of the grad students, was just so happy to, uh, to be like in a costume and to have like <laughs> facial hair and a wig, like he just wanted that because he's always playing like the handsome boyfriend, you know. And so uh. he was just like thrilled. To, you know, it's one of these things where you're giving these guys opportunities to do something a little bit different, and they just like chew it up. I see. Now, uh, obviously, Doctor Zimbardo is involved in the in the process. Were any of the original subjects involved in the in the filming? Not at all. Okay. No, it was a, it was a careful and deliberate choice for me. Part of it was that I felt what they would contribute to it, had, that research had already been done, okay. right? That uh, he had done extensive follow-up interviews. There's also interviews leading all the way up to just like maybe 10 years ago less that you could see online. Wow. But I wasn't, while I felt we were representing Dr. Zimbardo directly, and and his and his wife, Dr. You know, Dr. Christina Maslach, or Dr. Christina Zimbardo directly, I felt that Everyone else, it would, it would do a disservice if I was trying to cast someone that looked like this person. Mm. Or We weren't learning about them, right? The only people we learn about outside of the experiment is him. And so for me, it felt like, we, when we changed all their names, not even for legal reasons, we changed them because I didn't feel, I, I met a woman the other day, she goes, my brother was one of the guards. My brother was John Mark. And I go, I couldn't even tell you who played him in the film. Because we were, in order to reduce it down into a two hour movie, we were combining certain things people did. I see. So it was, they were being defined, these people were being, characters were being defined by the actions they took inside of the experiment. And I felt if I even connected the, re, the actors to the real people, it just would have created this cacophony of, uh, of it just felt like we weren't actually making a movie about those individuals. We were making a movie about the actions they took. And you know, it's, it's, it's a tricky decision because you don't want to make a movie then where someone goes and sees it and says, oh, it was nothing like that. I wish you would have touched base with me and I could have sold you this, this, and this. But when there's so many, it would have been a, a dark, I, I think it would have been an endless pit. I yeah. understand. The other thing is um, a number of the prisoners and a number of the guards to this day said, I was just acting. I was just acting. It wasn't the situation affected. I just chose to be a prisoner who broke down. I just chose to be an evil guard. And I tell them, I said, wow, that's really great. I don't know any professional actor who can stay in part eight hours a day, day after day, day after day, day after day. Uh, so I think, I think they were right. They started playing a role, especially the guy who plays John Wayne. Uh, uh, in, a, in the movie, it's, it's played brilliantly. Brilliant, uh, yeah. He was an 18-year-old college freshman at Whitman College, interested in drama, and he saw the movie Cool Hand Luke recently, and he just chose to be Strother Martin. <laughs> and it was a conscious choice on his part. And, but the point is, you'll see, once he gets into the role, he becomes evil. I mean, in fact, it's, it's the definition of creative evil. Uh, and then he's, he's stuck in that role. And he's the one who says, you know, now the guards worked eight hour shifts so that they were home doing the usual thing. Some of them had another. He, and he's the one who says, you come in, you put on your guard uniform, you put on the uh, uh, silver reflecting sunglasses, idea I got from the movie Cool and Louis. You get the billy club, you step out on the yard and you are a guard. This is what he said later. Hmm. And then he said in a recent, after Abu Ghraib, our prison, our prison study got, got infamous again, and he was interviewed and he said, 
Given a little more time, we guards could have got where they were. And he said, you know, we were just getting off our jollies by being puppeteers, and the prisoners were our puppets. This is 30 years later. That is not acting. <laughs> that is taking the mentality he created 30 years, 44 years ago in, into the present. Well, what that says to me is that there is power in what we call acting, right? This is I talked oh, yeah. to the actors a lot about this. I was like, your professional role player is playing unprofessional role players in, in right. a, this experiment. Good. And so you need, to stay, yeah, you need to stay the professional role player. You know, that was sort of the thing. And that's why it was actually a really pl fun and pleasant set. Um, at least, especially when we were working with the kids, because we were con they were constantly aware of that. But I think I'm mostly certain it's a Vonnegut quote, which is embarrassing because I have a Vonnegut tattoo. But <laughs> where he said, you know, be careful what you pretend to be, because you become what you pretend to be. I see. And I do think that that to me was a really interesting thing to see actors do. Or they, you know, I wasn't trying to make a movie that was super aware of it's like that meta quality, but. There is something that it said. It would be interesting for someone who is in the like acting world or writes papers about the acting theories to write. Okay, what is you know where is it? Or you hear these stories of actors who get lost in parts or whatever it might be, and it's really hard for them to return to their lives and their family lives. And it's an ex I think it's a really similar extension of what was going on there, where it does start as fun and games, and at a certain point, if you're really good at it, you know, if you access yourself, you lie to yourself enough. And so you know, our goal in making the film was to not get that far. You know, okay. to get that far when the cameras are rolling and then you shut it off. <laughs> Do you have any close calls? Right. Yeah. No, no. I mean, we we did when Chris is doing the push-ups at the end. Uh, you know, he was just like, look, let's just do it. You know, so he was really doing the push-ups. Like Jack and Logan were really sitting on his back. Wow. And um, and he was like, I can give you like three takes. You know, fortunately, he was like the strongest. He was probably the strongest guy in the cast. So, but I had physically, asked him, physically, physically, yeah. But I had asked all the actors to stop working out. You know, because I didn't want them to be. There was a few scenes we shot that weren't in the film where they were had to bathe before the visitors come. And you don't. People in the '70s didn't have. You know, that was Matt Weiner's rule for his actors weren't. That's what they always said. The actors aren't allowed to go to the gym or on right, Mad Men because right. it's like that's not how people looked. And um, right. these actors only had two weeks' notice. You know, most of them. I mean, we were so we had no rehearsal period or anything. But so by the time he got to lunch. We got to lunch and it was like a skate steak kebabs or you know it was for lunch and Chris's arms were like like he couldn't do it. I had to like take the steak off for him and you feel bad, but but even then it was like he was like he was invigorated by it, you know. And wow. so there was never a time where you no know, these actors were actually having fun. I have video, I have like dozens of videos on my phone of when we were shooting the raid stuff and Nick Braun, the really tall guy, has Ezra against the wall like in between takes while moving the camera just to keep their energy up, they would just like play wrestle. Like I have like, they were just having a blast. You know, it was like for them Wonderful. that's yeah. fun. That's what they were there for. That's what they love. Yeah, but the scene is where um, the, the evil uh, John Wayne guard uh, has him do push-ups and then literally is stepping on his back, pushing yeah. him down and then has two prisoners sit on him while he's still doing the push-ups. So that's, he may, and that really happened in the study but it was amazing that he could even do one. Yeah. You know, well, and two people sitting on him. And, and it was interesting, speaking of the moments where it does, this just popped in mind, you know, Chris is struggling and, and probably legitimately starting to tear up. And he falls and we were, and the producers are on my case because we're union project and we're already in grace period and lunch. And like, we need to go. And I'm like, this guy is literally <laughs> killing himself for us. We need to not cut him off. And Michael, at the end of the take, throws him back up against the wall and he's like, you can't even do one lousy push-up. And it was totally made the lineup. And I was like, this is the most, yeah, he made it up right there, didn't even think about it. He doesn't remember really saying it. And I was like, that is the cruelest thing I've yeah. ever heard. And, but you know, it was, it came from his character and it really wasn't to yeah. him. There was still that line. And, but we didn't get it on camera. So yeah. they were like, we got to break for lunch. And I was like, I have to get that line. I was like, there's no way I'm not going to shoot that line. And Hold so then, the lunch. yeah, so we like, I just, you know, they were like calling for lunch. I think people, you know, the grips are like, fuck this. And they're like walking out and, and everything like that. And, um, and and it was just, but you're not, you know, you don't have to. Yeah. It's a weird thing because I like to follow the rules, and a lot of the, a lot of the great filmmakers don't follow the rules, you know. But the thing I always do try to remind myself, and it's really hard in a movie like this where there's no much, so little time. But you know, you hear. I, I worked for Warren Beatty for a while, and he's infamous for doing like hundreds of takes. I've never done more than five takes. This film, we never did more than two or three, if there, right. except there was no time to. But you know, one time I was like, "Well, why do you do so many takes?" And he goes, "Well, because everything that costs money here, like the set, the food, the, the getting the actors here, the locations." He's like, "The thing." that costs the least amount of money is the film and the camera, or in this case, the hard drive and the camera. You know, that's the cheapest thing there. So why aren't you gonna always keep on running? And <laughs> and there's, there's a modified truth to that, that you can harness without doing 100 takes. How long, okay. how long did the, the prisoner guard uh, take? Was it two weeks or? That, yeah, two and a half, we were there two and a half weeks in that hallway, and then we had like a week and a half, a little, yeah, a week and a half in another building where all the outside stuff was. 
Very cool. Well, uh, not to not to interrupt the, the the mojo here, but so we had a screening last night, and, and about ten of us in a group uh, went together. Uh, there was a hundred of us, but ten of us in a group that I was with. And I remember the movie movie ends, the credits roll, and there's just radio silence from all my friends and I for quite a while. And it's been a while since I've been to a movie where every one of my friends and I were just blown away. Everybody, two thumbs up, rave reviews, loved it. Now the the first thing that came to us. Um, as we're talking through it is about half of us were like, you know what? I bet you it was that intense. I bet you they didn't take too many liberties. I'll bet you that's what it was like. And half the folks were like, I don't know, man. There's, there's some stuff, some, some of the stuff there. I don't know if I could have taken it. So we're curious. Um, I could have taken it if I was there. No, they're saying that the, what what in the film is 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 oh, was made up okay. or exactly. exaggerated. Precisely, and, yeah. I mean, he could speak a little more. I'll let him speak a li literally. We'll say that first, and I'll say my two cents. Yeah, I mean. So they've compressed six days into two hours. Now, if anything, there were a lot of dramatic things that happened in the real study that were uh, cut, deleted or they couldn't put in because of budget. So there's nothing in the film, uh, the, none of the dramatic events in the film were made up. They all mimicked what, what really happened. Wow. The last scene, I think, puts together three things uh, that happened uh, was uh, separated uh, by some more hours. Uh, and so the last scene is riveting, overwhelming, emotionally distressing. Um, and I'm worried the first time I saw that, I said, you know, people are going to walk out of here in tears and say, you know, <laughs> screw this. It's you know, I, didn't, I didn't pay 12 bucks to, you know, to yeah. the <laughs> but, but the goal is, how do you transform that emotional distress to intellectual self-analysis? What kind of guard would I have been? What kind of prisoner? If I was, if I was the Zimbardo character, wouldn't I have ended it sooner? Mm -hmm. should, should he, should he run it for two weeks? As, as, you know, so, and then, if this is, a, if this is a simulated prison, what must, what must it be like to be in a real prison where guards have guns and power over you, and and there are gangs you know, among the prisoners? They're all gangs. So our prison is really more like a prison of war camp. Hmm. You see, because everybody comes in the same time. Hmm. If, if you go to a prison, there's a prison hierarchy. There's guys who have been there 30 years. There's the really bad guys. There's gangs. There's black, Hispanic, uh, skinhead, white gangs. Uh, and, and again, if, you come, if, you, if you're in prison and you're a young guy and you don't have a gang connection, you're going to be a sissy. The only question is how long. So, so there's a whole dynamic which I know operates in system. I studied prison, which we didn't have. So in a funny way, it's like everybody starts in a, in a prisoner of war camp. So, so that nobody has a history. Hmm. And the curious thing is that everyone got trapped in the expanded moment. We bugged the cells, and 90% of all the conversation was about the prison, the food, the guards, uh, escape. That means they knew nothing about each other. They knew the old college students. They didn't say, you know, what, what school do you go to? What are you majoring in? And not, nothing about the future. What are you going to do when you get out? Because all of them are going to start. It's, it's the end of summer school. They're all going to start uh, in September. And I should mention only two students were Stanford students, one guard and one prisoner, because we did it in the summer, and kids are finishing up summer school at Berkeley, at, at Stanford, and other places. Uh, in the movie, it, they mentioned Stanford three times, so, uh, so some people believe that they were all Stanford students. That is done in the basement of Jordan Hall at Stanford, but, but it, it's, it's universal for college students. I see. White college students, most. Well, and my feeling too of the, you know, we obviously we stayed very true. I mean, I, I, it's, I have sort of like three pronged thing to that. One is the idea of saying something is based on a true story means nothing anymore. <laughs> you know, I mean, I thought. I remember when I read when I read the script, it was. Uh, there was a movie around that time, maybe it was last year or something, or two years ago. There was a movie with Eric Bana where he's like a cop fighting demons in New York, and it was like based on the true accounts of it. You know, and it's like, well, no, it's not based on a true story. Maybe this guy says that happened, but you know, we know there aren't demons in New York, and so, the, and it really, it started with The Exorcist, I think, you know, and that's not a slam in that movie, but that started with that idea of the lure of the fear. So now when we go see The Conjuring, it's like in the summer of, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, and for me, I sort of felt, but then we look at our really historical films, like Lincoln brazenly makes stuff up. It, vote, it changes public voting record, you know, when they're, when they're voting on the, uh, you know, when, at the end of the film, when they're voting, it just made it up for more tension. So, I mean, that's something that whether they're, you know, and I feel, and that's not even a slam on that movie, you know, it's so, but for me, I felt like when you look at that, to say our film is, you know, I think fair when you say about 90% accurate, 
I think is an overwhelming number when the movies we look at or consider historical probably live more in the 30%, in many cases maybe the 10% or something. So uh, we set our threshold much higher. Now having said that, I do think people who are there, I mean in terms of like a lot of the words and the dialogue is coming from that, I suspect, and I haven't talked to anybody who was in the experiment, I suspect they might say something like, well, it really wasn't that bad. You know, you watch the footage and it doesn't seem that bad, but, but that, that's where what I was doing wasn't exaggerating it. I was saying, okay, well, I'm telling you to look at this. By right, You start to question, okay, what's your job as a filmmaker, not a documentarian, but a filmmaker, is to create an emotion. And so I'm putting music in, I'm putting cuts in, I'm putting close-ups in, I'm doing all these things slow that motion. say slow motion, yeah. I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing, and performance, you know, so you're doing things that say, we're evoking this emotion. And it's not about trying to Hollywoodize it or create something like that, it's just trying to say, this is the story we're trying to tell. So if someone, to me, if someone came, maybe someone will come forward and be like, oh my God, it was exactly the same. And that'd be really enriching to hear, but mm -hmm. at the same, or maybe horrifying, but you know, <laughs> but at the same time, if someone came forward and wrote something that was nothing like that, and they, it's Hollywood doing again, I'd be like, well, you have the right to feel that way, but we also had the right to say, okay, here's this close-up, and here's this performance, and here's the music, and all the things that, it becomes fiction. As soon as you put a camera in front of something, it's, as soon as you put a cut into something, it's, it's, it becomes fiction in a way. And I mean that, speaking of narrative filmmaking, that, that's a totally different conversation with documentary filmmaking, but even then, nowadays, documentary filmmaking, especially the trend lately, has be, they've become, it's become very blurry. See. With fiction, but that's a that's now this is a totally different. Thing. I understand. <laughs> so speaking of emotion and invoking emotion, so what I appreciated most about the film uh, was not particularly just uh, the moments where things get really tense, or sometimes there's 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 physical force used. For me, it was when folks decide they're out. When some of the prisoners decide, I'm done with this, and they start trying to find a way to scheme a way out of this. Yeah. I felt by the end of the film, like I was in this theater and there were times where I wanted out, of, just like the prisoners, right? And, and it was so powerful, not, not from the film, but I felt the prisoners is what I'm saying. Yeah. What I'm curious about is, is um, what was the contract, right? Like were they, were they able to get out? Um, was it paramount to keep them uh, involved as long as possible? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying it's a compliment. I think you guys did an yeah. incredible job of making you feel like the kids who are I, you know what's cell, interesting you know? is on a filmmaking set and I think the actual yeah. contract yeah. is an interesting thing yeah. to talk about was that I started to uh, before the movie premiered you know we shot it in October <laughs> premiered it in January so it was a really fast turnaround wow and I at the premiere uh, you know we premiered it at Sundance and you know it went from 12 people having seen this movie to two hours later 1300 people have now seen this movie and so it's an overwhelming feeling and it was weird because I was working so hard through the film to not, to make it brutal by the end, but not, so the first hour of the film, I think has moments of levity, there's a lot of humor. I really was telling the cast and working on the script to really make sure it wasn't, if it was harrowing 10 minutes in, you were fucked for the next hour right. or 50 minutes. Sorry, I don't know. Um, and so, you know, and so it was, for me, it was about trying to earn that ending and, and, and for it to crescendo to that as opposed to Absolutely. as opposed to being one of these movies that's just trying to brutalize you. And so, but because then even in the editing, for instance, it's 10 minutes, the big final sequence. In the first cut of the film, it was 30 minutes. And it wasn't a fat 30 minutes. It was a lot more stuff happened. Right. And so, you know, we were trimming away to say, well, we don't want to make a movie that's so, so when it was going to premiere, my feeling, my fear was that people were going to be like, um, you know, we've seen this before, <laughs> like who really cares? And the first question was that. They were like, did you think you made an experiment on the audience? Hmm. And I didn't understand the question. I probably gave a bad answer mm -hmm. because I thought the person was criticizing me, but I realized what they were saying was what you just said, which yeah. was what we did. And I think we, earn, we earned it through the effort of not trying to push people too far. I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. I think. I mean, I, you think. Well, maybe some people will think we pushed too far, but you know, it's a, it, that's where it really comes down to ed a conversation about editing. And... Um, but it was weird because I didn't anticipate that reaction. I was I was so nervous that the reaction would just sort of been like, oh, we've seen this, you know. And it wasn't. Um, but instead, it was sort of people were, people were having that same feeling of being hard to talk. And that's what I wanted to achieve. Right. Um, but maybe had feared I had it. And just really quick to just. But to he also he also a senior editor as well as director. I see. Yeah. There so I mean, go. and then you're editing you and you've been course. watching it nonstop oh, over and over. I can't watch the movie anymore. You know, I poked <laughs> my head in. It opened in theaters in L.A. last Friday at the theater I go to. You know, sometimes three times a week. And so I was like, I have to poke. I've never seen any of my own movies on the screen. I, I like poked my head and I was watching one scene and then I was like, I should have done that. 
you like there was a scene where like someone leaned back in a chair and I was like how come there's not a squeak there like you, know, you start seeing those things <laughs> oh, and then no. you're like then you have Editing. to stop that's why you can't watch the movie you know I think it's I all, I think I read an interview I think it was Alfonso Cuarón who was like who did Gravity where he was like when I finish the oh, film no. I watch it at the uh, at the at the premiere with an audience and I never watch it again oh, my and God. It par it's partly due to that and it's partly due to that I need to be here and speak about the film hopefully like in an engaging way and if I'm thinking about the three frames I should have cut between those shots you can't and in addition to that you want to move you want to be able to move on I'm not one of those people I don't I get really confused by the filmmakers who go back and recut their movies years later. I think it's, there's something, you know, kind of, I find something kind of... No director's cut. Sad no. about, yeah, the director, well, sometimes the director's cut is because the studios, you know, give you an opportunity to put your version out. In this case, this is enough of my version that I wouldn't do it. There's certainly some things that were contentious between me and the, and the producers and financiers, but nothing I can't live with at the end of the day, so... Uh, it being a representative of the movie I wanted to make, I think, well, I don't want to go back. Yes, of course I'm going to look back in 10 years and be like, well, I should have done a million things. I look back in 10 months now, less even, and want to change a million things. But it was representative of the restrictions I was under, physically, time, money, and it was a representative of who I was at 31 and all of these other things, and you don't want to change that. You just want to move on and then make the next one with what you learned. I understand that. And just to clarify, when I when I mentioned being in the audience and wanting to wanting to be like you know wanting to, to oh, hang yeah. out, right? What I mean is, I'm starting to plot with these prisoners. I'm thinking, oh, yeah. oh, how sure. would I, I get out? Yeah. How how would I get out? I didn't out think right you now, meant right? like, no, 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 no. I leave? <laughs> no, and I think I think you guys captured that. No, I think you guys captured that incredibly well. So, what was it yeah. like for these prisoners? How how do they get out if they wanted no. to? There was a magical formula that the Human Subject Committee said. All they had to say is, I quit the experiment. If you say, I want out, you know, I'm sorry, I don't understand that language. <laughs> if they say, I can't take it, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong language. So, so essentially, um, implicitly, they are saying, I quit the experiment. But literally, if they use that phrase, they would have been released. After day one, the word experiment ceases to exist. Hmm. They, I, they say, I want out. Okay, write a letter to the parole board. <laughs> so we had a parole board. Now, in the movie, we only show one prisoner. Every prisoner, except, every prisoner except one um, oh, yeah. uh, uh, applied for the parole board. And the parole board was headed by an ex-convict, brilliantly played, yeah. who had just got out of prison after 17 years, who hated parole boards because they had turned them down 16 years in a row. And so he <clears throat> plays the role, and he becomes his enemy, and he says that, the, he literally got sick. He's a friend of mine, Carlo Prescott, got sick because he did this brilliant performance, an improvisational performance, not for the camera, but for, uh, now again, uh, there, we had secretaries. Uh, they, showed, they showed me and the staff there, it was not the case. It was secretaries of a different part of the building. And the most dramatic thing that happens at the end, uh, he said, okay, take him away, stand up, and then we ask, uh, if, we were to, if we were to parole you, would you be willing to forfeit all the money you have earned as a prisoner? Everyone says yes. The only reason they're there is for 15 bucks a day. They just said, I don't want your money. What should they have done? I'm, I'm out of here. And they take them away. They put their hands out. The guards put the handcuffs, put the bag, and take them away. At that point, they are prisoners. It's not an experiment. <laughs> I see. I want to uh, turn it over to the audience. I have one more question about sure. the three doctors in Bardo. Just um, uh, coming into the film and, and having done a little research on it beforehand, I was really looking for the moment, uh, the turning point, where uh, uh, I guess I guess motivations get changed. Yeah. I was looking for the moment where the guards cross the line when when people change. You, you talk about these being smart, intelligent college students. Yeah. When does that change happen? And I noticed, I think, twice in the film, there's a moment where it gets a little physical, it gets a little violent. There's also a moment where somebody does try to get out. And it seemed in those moments that the guards and, and your researchers, everybody kind of looked to you and wanted to know what you thought would happen next. And in those moments, initially, before you obviously canceled, you called it off six days in, initially you said, let's keep going, let's let, let's let it run. Did you feel caught up in the moment? Did you feel like your own motivations were changed as well? No, and there's no question. I mean, the main part of the study is... Um, the most interesting part of the study for me, the takeaway message is, everybody's kids, okay? You know, I'm, a, I'm an old guy, I'm 36, I guess, or 38 years old, and I'm a seasoned researcher, and I get caught up in the system I created. And again, it was by being the principal investigator, you know, I should have stopped it after the second kid broke down, we proved our point, mm -hmm. you know? But because I had in my mind, we wanna go for two weeks, and the prisoner breakdown, my job as principal investigator is, get a replacement, I think, so get a replacement. Um, and uh, take them to student health. 
So, so I got trapped in that role. And there's a scene, uh, the real transformation was after visiting days, parents had to see the superintendent. So they came to my office and said, superintendent. And there's a scene where I become something I hate. I become a sexist, OK? Meaning a mother and father come, and the mother says to me, I don't mean to make trouble, sir. Red light, bing. Nobody says that unless you're going to make trouble. And she says, I've never seen my son looking so terrible. And I said, and then I, so at that moment, I know she's going to blow the whistle. I, f I immediately flip, and I do what every authority does. I say, what seems to be your son's problem? Okay, so I'm making it dispositional when we're studying the situational force. I know exactly what happened. She said, well, you know, he hasn't been sleeping. Uh, I said, does he have insomnia? Again, what's wrong with your kid? She says, no, uh, they, uh, he told me they wake them up all hours of the night. I said, oh, yes, of course we do. That's the counts. Each guard shift has to account for the fact that prisoners have not escaped. And then she says again, I don't mean to make trouble. What am I going to do? Okay, put, who, who's my cast? There's the mother who's going to make trouble, and there's the father who's been silent. Both of them have just seen their kid looking terrible. Okay? I turn to the father, what do I say? Don't you think your son is tough enough to take it? <laughs> <laughs> At that moment, she's a silly little woman. And, and I, th I think we probably did, did a, you know, a, a guy shake. And he said, of course he is. He's a real leader. They kept. And at that moment, you know, he says, come on, honey, he takes her away. You know, I, I felt so terrible because I realized what I had just done. I had be become, again, a sexist guy, you know, seizing the moment. For what reason? To save my prison. Because and she was going to make trouble, and she would have. He broke down that night. He, he's 819, had a, had a breakdown that night, and she was exactly right. And the, her husband, the kid's father, sold him out. And it was, I remember when we were shooting that scene in the film that day, um, I was shooting a building downtown, and there was like, it was Saturday night, and so people were started going out to the clubs that were like nearby, so there was literally like, like there was like drunk people like banging on the doors of the building, like, hey, what's going on? Like, what are you doing in there? And and Billy was trying to you know work up sort of the, that the anger you're talking about of this woman. Yeah. And you could I could hear him on the mics, you know, before he would run takes, he would say these things to himself. Like, this is my experiment. You're not taking this away from me. <laughs> Who do you think you are, you woman? You would say these things, and they were they were so they were so great. It was so fascinating to hear how you but you run those things, or you you don't just think them, but you say them out loud, and then it. You, you kind of get that, so he would sort of have that. And nevertheless, then there's like, you know, there's like drunk people like banging on the windows that just sort of like came alive. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. so, so again, so here, forget about the kids. So here's um, me getting into the role. Here's Carlo Prescott, a seasoned criminal, a felon, who again plays the role of the, of the um, uh, parole board head and becomes that. And the third character is, there's a scene where a Catholic, Catholic priest comes in, talks to the kids. I, I taught a course in the psychology of imprisonment uh, in, at Stanford in July with Carlo Prescott in order for me to learn about prisons. And this priest heard about that and came to see me in my office hours, said he was doing a term paper on something. Could I give him some references? I said, great deal. How about you come, I will do that. How about you come down to the study and inter interview some of the prisoners and tell me how realistic it is? Because he had been a prison chaplain and a prison in Washington. He comes down knowing it's an experiment, and in two minutes, he is the prison chaplain. And what you see in the movie is exactly what happened. He says, you know, uh, he introduces up on Father Coughlin, what's your name, son? Almost every kid said their number. I'm 819, I'm 216. And then he says, what are you in for? And they said, what, what do you mean? What is your charge? And again, when, when we had the police arrest, the police always said, wanted for penal, violation of penal code 459 PC, um, robbery, breaking and entry. They gave that. And then he says, what are you doing to get out? I look at I said, what do you mean? So I don't understand. <laughs> and the words are exact. You're in jail. What are you doing to get out? Uh, and again, he said, you're a college student, right? You need a lawyer. You're in jail. And I'm looking, you know, I'm saying, wow, he's really into it. And he says this to each kid, the kid, I mean, so he. And it's I, a different era, too, where priests represented something uh, a little bit. Yeah, this, uh, yeah seven. This I mean, it's this, this is pre scandal, pre, yeah. A pre, pre incest priest. <laughs> yeah, you want to. No, and, and it was an interesting thing because even we were trying to cast that part, a lot of the actors who came in played the nice priest. Yeah. And w the one guy who came in and understood that the scene was really more 
that, that it was not that he was a mean priest, but he was just like, what are you here for? What are you in for? And it's like that thing of like, wait, you're this priest. And, and then also then the next day there was a, this isn't in the film, but there was a lawyer who came in yeah. who was somehow, he called the lawyer, one of the kids and no, the he, lawyer, or what, something yeah, happened no, where. No, it, one of the kids said. Oh, that's right. One yeah. of the kids said, I have a cousin as a public defender. He said, well, we should get him. He said, well, uh, uh, I don't have his number here. Uh, call my mother. So the kid gave the priest his mother's number. The priest called the mother. The mother called the public defender. And then the real thing, the public defender came down on Friday. And that, that's how I ended the study. And at that point, it was just but the, like, Even the lawyer was using yeah. certain vernacular of, yeah. you know, yeah. hey, have you done your parole hearing yet? Or yeah. let's start preparing what you're going to do. You know, I mean, it yeah. was a, there was a certain thing where that's what we we're saying, the power of the role. You give yourself even just a little bit yeah. of that. Yeah. ability yeah. to be that, yeah. then you yeah. become it. Yeah, so I'm saying we focus on the prisoners and guards, but I'm saying here's a priest, here's a public defender, here's me, uh, here's a seasoned ex-convict. Everybody starts playing a role, and that's really the message, and you become the role. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, in your life, I mean, you know, who are you? I, you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator, uh, I'm a, a Google co a coder, I'm, you know, so, and then that's, that's, your, that's your job, the job becomes your role, and then it's your identity. You say, who are you? That's what you say. Um, Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, we'd love to turn it over to you guys for some Q&A as well. And we want to we end with this after Q&A. Absolutely. <laughs> We're going to. Okay. Uh, my name's Daniel uh, Steinberg, and in, with the experience of 40 years of, ex of understanding of all this, it, it seems as if Abu Ghraib should not have been a tremendous shock to those of us who yeah. you know, had followed any of this. The question is, is it possible, and is there any example of a prison um, in which this kind of behavior can be avoided? And, and do any countries have prisons where they have a completely different paradigm that works? Yeah, it's, um, so prison, you know, the most wonderful coincidence is that President Obama last week visited a prison for the first time in the history of America. No president in several hundred years ever visited a prison. Meaning that uh, whether or not you're liberal or not, you know, we are paying millions of dollars in taxes to maintain 2.3 million American citizens in prison. Uh, and hopefully he's going to, he looks like he's going to uh, try to push some prison reform. Prisons are designed to punish. They are not designed to rehabilitate. They're not designed to educate. Uh, they are designed to punish. Now, when somebody, when a jury or a judge uh, uh, gives a prison sentence, the only sentence is, you have lost your freedom for this period of time, period. It doesn't say, and therefore, we're going to humiliate you, therefore we're going to put you in solitary confinement, therefore we're going to punish you. And the idea is you got all these guys, many of whom are uneducated, have opportunity to educate them. They're going to be there two years, three years, five years. You could teach them coding. You could teach them all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and you could teach them. So the original prisons were called penitentiaries, meaning you have time to think about the stuff you've done and be penitent about it, you know. But the point that it's been so transformed into simply places of punishment, where prisoners come out most of them broken and, and hate the, hate the system. It turns out there's a prison. It was in the New York Times a few weeks in Norway, uh, which you know uh, trains the guards in how to be compassionate, uh, trains the prisoners in how to be you know accept their role with dignity. And apparently they have like no recidivism. Uh, you know, uh, so I don't remember the name of it, but it, I know there's a prison in Norway that, that does what you say. And clearly we need a, just a new model. We need a, a model. For, okay. The, the other thing we should be concerned about is the data is that within three years of being released, 60 to 70 percent of all prisoners released return on another crime. In some cases, even even more severe one. That means that's the definition of failure. You know, so you, know, so you let somebody out, and three years later, they're doing the same or worse thing again. Uh, oh, I'm Melissa Hi, Smith. I'm an intern, actually, at Google this summer. Right. And actually a psychology major, so this is pretty fun. Where? Um, as where? a famous like, psychologist. Psychology you know, major where? At George Mason in DC. Oh, great. Yeah, of course. I know. <laughs> so how do you feel about people associating you essentially only with the Stanford Prison Experiment? You've done lots of other research and lots of other really interesting things. Like so. what? <laughs> <laughs> No, you're right. I mean, I mean, it's, it's this little demonstration we did in six days. And it's, in one way, it's a curse. Um, when I, so I never wrote a book about it. After I did this study, um, I wrote a few articles. It became famous instantly because of um, 
uh, serendipitous circumstances. The day after we did our study, on August 21st, 1971, there was an alleged escape attempt of Soledad brother George Jackson from San Quentin, in which he was killed, people say murdered by the guards. And, but before he was, he released all of his buddies from solitary confinement, who then killed all the informants, killed some guards, and prisons were in the news. Three weeks later, at Attica prisons, at Attica prisoners revolted against, took over the prison, first time, took over the whole prison, in sympathy to George Jackson's murder. Uh, and, and suddenly there was a Senate Judiciary Committee on crime, and here I am knowing nothing about prisons other than my base. And I'm in Washington, D.C. talking about prison reform. <laughs> I'm in San Francisco <laughs> talking about juvenile justice. Uh, and, uh, but I should say, you'll appreciate this. Um, so I'm sitting next to the Superintendent Mancuso of Attica, uh, a, a warden park of San Quentin, the head of g the guard union, the head of prisoners' uh, union. I know nothing about prison. So what do I do? I say, would you mind if I began by showing a slideshow of the research we just did? What that means is everybody now shares the same visual. And from then on, people said, as we saw in Zimbardo's prison, guards are de the guard role dehumanizes prisoners. Not in his experiment, they said, as we saw in Zimbardo's So suddenly, I had status I didn't, I didn't earn. And, and people are turning to me, well, why do you think guards dehumanize prison? They're talking to me rather than the superintendent, rather these other people. Uh, so that was a game. So the thing I feel most, so the main thing I did right after the study is, I began to study the psychology of shyness in adults. Before that, psychologists only studied shyness in kids. And they, so this is called developmental psychologists. Their cutoff point is 13. Once you get to be 13, then somebody, so it was as if you thir when you're 13, you stop being shy. No, nobody studied you. So I studied shyness as a self-imposed psychological prison where the prisoner in you says, here's the list of things you can't do. And the, the, the guard in you, and, and the, I mean, the guard says, which you can't, and the prisoner in you says, okay, I, I deserve the raise, but I won't ask the boss to dance. I know the answer, I won't, uh, I paid $10, I know how to dance, I won't ask the girl. So, so, so essentially, and you end up saying, I'm worthless. So I began to study shyness. I had a shyness seminar at Stanford. I started doing research on shyness and discovered that to be not shy is the rare exception. In the universe, there's not more than 5 to 10% of people in any country who are not shy. So shyness, people say, I'm shy now. I used to be shy, I'll grow it. I'm shy in situations, is the norm. So we did research, and then I started a clinic at Stanford, and now it's in Palo Alto University designed exclusively to treat shyness. And we get 90 to 100% cure. Because we know, it's, we know exactly what causes it, we know how to, how to contain it, we know how to treat it. So that's what I'm most proud of, because it's, it's an interesting idea. Uh, we did research on it, and then we ended up doing applied. Oh, and then I wrote two books, uh, Shyness, What It Is, What To Do About It, and The Shy Child, that, that sold, you know, written for the general public. And so I, so I, that's my legacy. Well, and I definitely feel a little, um, I felt like a little burdened by that, I, that idea, too, knowing how much he'd done outside of this experiment. And part of the thing that, you know, when I came aboard, I kind of had to say was, okay, we're only making a movie about these six days. If you made a film called the Dr. Philip Zimbardo story, <laughs> it would be wildly different, right? This would be one portion of it. And you have to make that decision because you can't, we could only afford one sentence at, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a title card at the end of the film was really all we could do to try to encapsulate that cheap feeling. Film, cheap film, <laughs> Yeah, and it was, and it really, I get a I mean, sentence. <laughs> yeah, and it was, and it was a, you know, it's, it's, it's just one of the challenges of making it into a movie, and you can only hope that the movie leads people to the Lucifer effect that then leads people to all these other things. You can only, you can only hope for that or engineer it to hopefully do that, but you can't, uh, the movie couldn't take on that responsibility being called the Stanford Prison Experiment, but it was definitely like a challenge to not include things like that. Uh, to what extent do you think the finding of the study, the experiment, can be used as ex corporate excuse for evil doers? Like, do you worry people knowing that there is this situational evil, it will affect their behavior? Thank you. That's a good question. So that's what ties to Abu Ghraib. Um, uh, when Abu Ghraib happened in 2004, um, Somebody made a lot of money releasing 12 film, 12 images that the soldiers had taken. So these were army reservists. They were not real soldiers, <clears throat> and that's really a key. Uh, they were army reservists, uh, 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 military <clears throat> police guards in the, in the basement in Abu Ghraib uh, on the night shift, Tier 1A. And um, 
it turns out they were 12 of more than 1,000 images. M many of the images that were not released are much worse. And what happened was I had a former Stanford student who was working at NPR, and I happened to be in Washington, called me and said, hey, Dr. Z, do you see those images? I said, no. He said, they're right out of the prison study. Guards putting bags over prisoners' heads, stripping them naked, and having them simulate you know, sexual activities. You know, do you want to come and talk about it? So I did an interview the next day at NPR, and I said, look, I, I, I know nothing about that situation, but there's enough similarity. It looks like the Stanford Prison Study on steroids, uh, because in our study went for six days. This went for three months. The abuses took place over an extended period of three months. And, and I said, you know, um, I want to believe American soldiers are good apples. Because you remember, uh, the military and the Bush administration said, these are a few rogue soldiers, a few bad apples. Whenever there's a scandal, the system protects itself by saying, don't blame us, blame them. And I said, my concern is somebody put the, our good apples in really bad barrels. So we want to know who did that. And those are the bad barrel makers. So when we want to understand any human behavior, it's not enough to make a dispositional individual analysis. We have to do a situational analysis. And then we have to put the situation in a systemic context. So that's the first time I use so bad apples, bad, ap uh, bad barrels, bad barrel makers. Uh, and, and that took off. So then I became an expert witness for the guard who should have been in charge of the night shift, uh, Chip Frederick. And in my testimony, I said uh, to, to the uh, presiding judge, Your Honor, Chip Frederick is guilty as charged. The fact that he did this in this unique situation does not change his guilt or innocence. So, you can't have, so the situation is not excusiology, but I can say with all expert confidence that he never would have done that had he not been put in that situation because I studied his entire life from the time he was born to now. He's an outstanding soldier, a patriot, he won many awards, and they put him in this situation which is the most extreme situation I could imagine. I won't go through all the details, but you know, he worked 12 hour shifts. When he finished his shift, he, he slept in a prison cell in a different part of the prison because the prison was under bombardment. And also, the abuses happened only on the night shift. Nine of nine guards on the night shift did these things, taking these pictures, you know, putting prisoners naked in pyramids, etc. None on the day shift. How could that be? So that's a situational variable. Zero of nine, nine of nine. It turns out the head of military police, I'm sorry, the head of military intelligence goes to the head of military police in, in Abu Ghraib and says, we're not getting any actionable intelligence. We're interrogating all these guys. We're getting nothing. And the military, the Bush administration is on our ass. The guys on your night shift have to take the gloves off. So you always use euphemism. Take the gloves off. They have to break the prison. And so when we interrogate them, they'll spill the beans. Okay? So essentially, you're giving them total power. And in three months, there's no, no evidence that any senior officer ever went down to the dungeon. So you're telling them, do what the fuck ever you want and nobody's going to notice, except when we interrogate them, hopefully they're going, to, they're going to give information. And on the day shift, senior officers were there all the time. So essentially the message there is power without oversight, power without surveillance is a recipe for abuse. It ha so the worst abuse at Stanford happened at night, because some, sometimes I, had I slept in my office upstairs, so I never, I never left the situation for that, for that uh, week. So, so that's the message. You give people absolute power, and without oversight, without limits, without constraints, over time, that power will be abused. And so, so my, my testimony reduced the sentence from 15 years to eight. Then we're going to give him 15 years. Uh, and the worst they did physically, he hit a prisoner once, but he, but he allowed a lot of the, uh, the de degrading images, the degrading practices. Um, after you did the Stanford Prison Experiment, I'm wondering, did you reflect on classic works of literature like Lord of the Flies? Oh, yeah. And the similarities, and, and what did you make of that in reflecting no, on No, yeah, that? I mean, I, I taught the Lord of the Flies. I, I've written about it. Um, uh, and it's, a, you, know, you know, it's a brilliant, Golding said, it's a really brilliant analysis of, you know, ordinary kids, you know, you know put, put, put in a new situation, uh, where essentially, if you remember, democracy takes over at, at first. The good kid, the big kids protect the little kids. And then the message is ultimately fascism rules. Uh, authoritarians take over. All you need is one or two. Uh, and, and there's a, a dramatic scene in the movie where, um, um, I knew it so well. Um, one, of, one of the guys strips himself naked. 
and, put, and then paints himself with a color. And he gets the other guys to change their appearance. And at that point, all hell breaks loose. I actually did research on de-individuation following that, meaning what happens when you make girls feel anonymous and their job is to shock other women, I mean college students shock the other women, versus when they feel identifiable. They gave twice as much electric shock, held their finger down on the shock button twice as long when they were anonymous. So, so I did that study before the prison study based on, on Lord of the Flies. You know, so again, good literature taps into good psychology. And, and what I try to do is have good psychology and map onto mm -hmm. good literature. We referenced that too when we were shooting the film. The last scene when, when his character comes in and says the experiment's over, you know, we talked a lot about their reaction. It was a really hard thing to get and they, the guys just did it right, which is sort of a sense of relief. But we talked a lot about that. What happens at the end when they show up and they're saved, they immediately resort back to like, almost like an infantile, right. the way it's written, they start like crying and wailing and they even start acting younger than their age. Yeah, yeah. And it's this interesting thing of how quickly you can fall down this hole and then how quickly our bodies get out of it too is, is really, that. in a weird way that's almost as alarming is that, yeah. you know, it, it, it bothers people that, for instance, at the end of the film, it says they all, none of them suffered any long-term abuse. People, people want don't want to understand that. All the, com, you know, yeah. all the reviews I read, they're like, well, yeah, sure, that's what the filmmakers want us to believe. And it's like, well, no, that's just the truth. Many of them went on, many, some went on to be psychologists, right. prison yeah. psychologists, right. you know, none of, none of these guys went on to be criminals right. or, yeah. you know, uh, had any kind of institutionalization or anything. And so yeah. it's an interesting thing. And I remember talking to the director of compliance, which is a, a subject matter, which is about the fast food hoax that Dr. Zubato has written about too. And his film, we had on our side the benefit of the this being much more famous. So people were like, oh, people know it really happened. But after compliance premiered, people were furious at him because they didn't yeah. want to believe it was true. And he was like, they were mad at me because they were mad at the story in the movie. But right. so they were mad. They didn't, couldn't accept they were mad at the story, so they were mad at the movie. And then in turn were mad at me and you can't say, well, it was real. You can only say that so much to someone because they don't want to believe it. Yeah, just very briefly, I'm, uh, I'm not sure how many people know. I think it was the compliance was the wrong name. So there was this fast food hoax. That was the name of the film. Yeah, yeah I don't know I what know. the overall, yeah. yeah it's, it, um, in 27 different states in the United States, some guy calls uh, a fast food restaurant, all different kinds, McDonald's, uh, whatever, and says, one of your employees, he says, I'm Sergeant um, Johnson, I'm Captain Johnson. Uh, we have evidence that one of your one of your new employees uh, has uh, been stealing, has contraband. We think it's related to drugs. Uh, uh, you can either you can either send her down to the police station, or you can wait, and we'll come and pick her up. And they said, which one? Well, the new one, the, uh, the uh, brunette. Oh, Jenny. Yeah, that's the one. It's Jenny. He did, he's making this up. He's in a phone booth. And then what happens is he said, well, bring it, bring it to um, your security area uh, and hold her there for, for questioning. And they do. So now you have security cameras are covering this. And then he says, OK, now while, while you're there, why don't you begin? So there's a female employee, uh, strip her naked, you know, do, do an initial search, and, and, tell it, and tell us what you're doing. And then in some cases, the woman says, well, I've got to go back uh, to the floor. He said, you know, do you have anybody who could cover you? Uh, you have a husband, a boyfriend? And this was, yeah, I have my fiance. He comes. And now here's this guy with a naked woman, and the, and the guy who's a voyeur is say, saying, OK, now I want you to follow my orders. Uh, she may have something under her breast, so feel under her breast. She may have something in her, in her anus, something in her, So he's now this poor girl, 18-year-old girl, he's, he's now doing this sexual stuff. And then finally ends up, OK, uh, uh, um, we, we still think she's guilty, so I want to punish her. So make, make her have oral sex on you. And it's all caught on, on the security camera. Uh, and he was finally caught. Uh, by really good detective work, but it's not one guy, one, I mean, it's one guy, but it's 27 different places. And everybody who sees the film blames the woman in the film who is the, the security manager. And she, she just says, you know, he was really convincing. I, you know, I was following orders like I do as a, as, you know, a low level employee at McDonald's. We follow orders. People say, do this stuff. And, and nobody wanted to believe it. It's the same thing. So they, they were angry at the filmmaker, they were angry at this woman. No, the guy you got to be angry at is this guy. guy he, act the yeah, the he actually got off because it was, it was, it was n from the time he was arrested, these things stopped. But there was, there was only circumstantial evidence. The good news is the woman who was, the young woman who was abused got a big court settlement. Um, and that's actually a perfect transition. I promise I'd end with one final question. And, and I'll, I'll ask it to you both, but in a different way. I'll let you guys okay. decide. So for, for you, I'll ask both of you, but for you, it's the classic, what do you want people to take away from the film? And what I'll address similarly to Dr. Okay. Zambard really quickly good. is sure. the way this came up was before we, we sat down, 
I told Dr. Zimbardo that whenever Kitty Genovese comes up, this trial, Milgram's experiment comes up, I am that guy in the room that says, no, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have gone that far. Uh, I wouldn't. I, I would have helped the person in need. I would not have let the situation affect who I am. I'm always that guy in the room. And so the question there as well, you know, we talk about the hero training that you're doing. It almost surprises me what you just said that you should blame the guy in the phone booth exclusively. Is it not also on those of us in society to stand by our morals and and risk uh, public ridicule to do what we think is the right thing? That's my handy no question. Yeah. 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 Yours. Uh, to take away from the film, like, honestly, I had one goal, which was just con conversation. Um, I didn't want the movie to tell you what you should be t talking about. You know, this experiment's still relevant 40, 44 years later, and it's relevant because every, it's always relevant, you know? And so I didn't want the movie to narrow that in or say, oh, it, look at what happened at Aubrey Gray, or I didn't want to contextualize it in our history because I wanted the movie to, to, to sort of be able to exist always. And so for me, it's just, if it leads to conversation, then it's great. You know, to me, that's that's the... It, it, that was the number one goal. Oh, or, or I should say fruitful conversation, obviously. You know, I mean, it leads to saying I fucking hated that movie. That's not the conversation <laughs> you wanted. But, you know, for me it was, and that's the goal with that. I just don't want to ever make a movie that you forget, you know, 10 minutes later. Wonderful. And, and in this case, it hopefully leads to, hopefully people look up the experiment and it leads them to more understanding. Absolutely. I think we all did. Thank yeah, you. PrisonExp.org is, is a great website that we've been... Uh, I've been involved with for like 20 years, and we've just redone it. It has everything there is about the prison, prison study, prisons, etc. cetera. Um, and so what I, would like to, what I would like to take away is um, the flip. So here, I created evil. See, criminologists, sociologists study evil from the outside in. I mean, you interview, interview uh, criminals, uh, you visit prisons. I wanted to create evil from the inside out, that is, put good people in a bad place and say, you know, who wins? Does the good people, if you have a bad place filled with good people, shouldn't they dominate? Or uh, if the bad place uh, is really bad and evil, doesn't the place win and humanity lose? And that, unfortunately, that's the conclusion. And in this study, what's in the movie, there are no heroes except the woman who challenges me, confronts me to say, what you're doing is wrong, that these are not prisoners, they're not guards, they're boys and they're suffering, it's your fault. And in, in the real experiment, she then says, we had just moved in, it, it shows, which is true at the beginning of the, of the movie. Uh, uh, she says, if this is the real you, I don't want to continue my relationship. We had just moved in. We, we're planning to get married. And so that's her role. She's willing to give up a romantic relationship, a marital relationship, for a moral principle about kids she doesn't even know. But she's, she saw the suffering. And so, so for me, so that's really heroic. So a hero is somebody who uh, comes to the aid of others in need uh, and or defends a moral cause, aware that there's cost. So altruism is heroism light. You give money to church, you give blood, doesn't cost you. So heroes are rare only because people in weighing the situation say it's not, it's not worth it. So whistleblowers are proactive heroes. That You see fraud, you see corruption, uh, you have to collect data, often you have to get people on your side. Most heroes are, are really more... Um, uh, impetuous, uh, uh, react. you react to the situation, like the famous hero in New York, the subway hero. The guy falls on the tracks, he jumps on the railroad tracks, puts the guy between the tracks as the train goes over them. For half an inch, he would have been a dumb, dead hero. He would have cut his head off. He, so, so essentially, so, so when we finished the study, I began, I mean, so when I started writing Looser Effect, I, I realized that I know nothing about heroes. Because I start, to lose, I start the last chapter is, how do you resist these powerful forces in all the research, in all the studies of evil in the real world, in the Holocaust, in Bosnia, Rwanda, there's always a small percentage, 10, 5, 10, never more than 30, of people who do it resist. I won't go along. They don't go along. In some cases, they not only don't go along, they challenge the evil. And I said, you know, I, know, I don't know anything about heroes. I never thought about it, and I should have, given... This woman who challenged me, we've been married for 44 years. So I began to do research on liter uh, library research on heroes. Turns out the word hero and heroism does not exist in any psychology textbook. It's not part of the positive psychology movement because uh, compassion and, and empathy are virtues. Heroism is a civic action. So essentially, I began to say, hey, wait a minute. What good is compassion and action if it doesn't lead to action, because action is what changes the world. So I started seven years ago in San Francisco 
uh, a nonprofit called the Heroic Imagination Project. The simple goal is to teach people, all people, especially young people, to learn how to express the inner hero that, that you all have, especially as kids. We had this inner hero. Not through superheroes, which is dramatic, but the wrong direction, because superheroes don't have the, the most important thing in the world that every kid has is a brain. They are the creation of somebody with a creative brain. So, so we say, every kid, you have something they don't have. And with your brain, you could create anything. So essentially, we're going to teach you how to be a wise and effective hero, how to analyze social situations, uh, uh, how, how to take wise and effective action. But the point is, we want to inspire you to always take the right action. Stand up, speak out in challenging situations, starting in your family, in your school, in your community. And then we have a training program. We teach people how to do this. And then the other thing uh, we do is I started uh, education, a revolution education. We have a number of lessons about the bystander effect, about uh, I know Carol Dweck was here from Stanford last week. How do you transform a, a fixed mindset, which you say I'm good or not good at this, uh, to a growth mindset? I'm good at anything if I put enough practice and effort. Uh, how to reverse prejudice, uh, how to change groups that have uh, negative influence to positive. So we call this Understanding Human Nature. And we have six of these programs. We hope to have uh, four more on c conservation and sustainability. But what's revolutionary is teachers don't teach. We give them a script. Uh, and and the, all the programs are organized around powerful videos, because kids live in a visual world. We show a video, and instead of having class discussion, the teacher has pairs, pairs or triads. And we try to have a boy and a girl together, because boys never answer in class, girls always do. And, and, and so essentially, you show the video of, of uh, a failure of a bystander, and then you say, what were the people thinking? Why didn't they help? What would you do? What's the difference between looking in a situation and being in? Then we show them the Kitty Genovese video. And then we say, you know, how does anybody study this? Then we show them video of, of uh, social psychology study this. And then we say, you know, uh, when, when should you help? When should you not help? Uh, uh, and then think of a time when you, you helped. Think of a time when you didn't help. And then we go through. So each, each of the six programs has the same eight activities. So once the teacher learns to do one, it's easy to transfer. And then the key is, at the end, you say, OK, spread the word. That's activity uh, eight. What does that mean? What's the most interesting thing you learned today? And the kid writes that. Now tell somebody. They write that. Tell your mother, your cousin, your bus driver, the grocery man. And the teacher, and then next week, he says, what did your mother say? My mother was, couldn't believe. How, how could it be that when there's a lot of people around, nobody helps? It's better to have just one. Now go back, ask your mother if she could tell one other person. So now this little lesson, which we now have re remote areas in Hungary, you know, some mother is telling the butcher <laughs> about the bias there in effect. Uh, so it's, in that sense, it's, it's really a revolution in education. Uh, and the problem that we have is we started here. We cannot get a program in any San Francisco high school because the high schools, they say, you know, it, if, if it's not STEM, if it's not preparing for the exams, we can't work it in. So our program is in all over Hungary. It's all over Poland. It's in Corleone, the godfather town in Sicily. Uh, and um, you know, so, so right now we're trying to, um, uh, we just applied for a Google Community Grant uh, because I have virtually no staff. We're, 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 we have a hero factory in my basement. We're creating these little <laughs> little heroes. Uh, so we, we need a staff. We need we need um, sophisticated help uh, uh, to move it to the next level. So we have the material. We have the desire uh, and and the inspiration. Wonderful. Well, thank you both, thank Kyle, you Dr. So Barter. Great to see you.